may be seated. Let us pray. Father of glory, give us your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom, of revelation of all that is holy. Give us the spirit of your Son, that sacred power living within us. Give us your Holy Spirit, that we might be your sons and daughters, heirs of your kingdom. Amen. Bob Dylan actually had a tune that he wrote about our Old Testament text this morning, and a part of the tune went something like this, God said to Abraham, kill me a son, and Abe said to God, you must be putting me on. It is indeed a difficult text, probably one of the most confusing texts in all of Scripture. Very few texts are are given their own name. This one is called the Akedah. The literal interpretation of that Hebrew word means the binding. Whenever you hear the Akedah, that is the binding of Isaac for sacrifice to God. Sir so Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, theologian, said this is one of, since the time he was a child, this was one of the, his most cherished texts. And it haunted him his entire life, and he said, I, became, I came to adore it more and more and understand it less and less. We would like to gloss over our Old Testament text this morning. We would not like to preach on it or teach on it. As a matter of fact, much of the curriculum nowadays in our Sunday school classes for children do not contain the Akeda, the binding of Isaac. Now, I came up in the old school, and our Sunday school teachers didn't shy away from very much, and I'll never, ever forget the graphic picture of Abraham standing over Isaac with a knife drawn. He's bound, and Isaac is screaming to high heaven. And we all emotionally limped home that day. And I never saw my father the same way. I slept with one eye open. God tells Abraham to go to Mount Moriah and take your son Isaac and sacrifice him as a burnt offering to me. It is a difficult text because human sacrifice is prohibited throughout all the scriptures. It is an abomination practiced by people outside of the Jewish faith. Some won't preach on it, refuse to do so. And the only reason why I'm preaching on it this morning is I'm leaving town. For a good while. Some scholars might relinquish this binding of Isaac as a kind of wives' tale, a tale that was embellished around the campfire through oral tradition. It is a tale told by a primitive people about how they understood God. After all, for us Christians, does not Jesus show us the fullness of God's love? Certainly, we don't have to be tested to prove that we are worthy. You might be thinking, come on now. God putting a human being to the test? God says, Abraham, kill me a son. And Abe says, God, you must be putting me on. Before we can unravel this text, I think, we need to understand how its background plays a part of what God has asked. It must be put into context. We refer all the time to the faith of Abraham, to 
the faith of Abraham. The New Testament talks about Abraham's great faith. But God in the beginning promises to Abraham that I will make you a great nation. Your descendants will be as many as the twinkling stars in the heavens and the grains of sands upon the earth. It's called a covenant, a promise. Trust me, Abraham, and I will provide for you. But Abraham's early years are anything but trust. You know, he follows more the creed of help yourself, and then God will help you. God always helps those who help themselves. The time has come for them to have children, but Sarah cannot conceive. Her biological clock is ticking. No, it is just worn out. Her childbearing age is past, and there, where in the world is the fruit of the promise to Abraham? So maybe they would help God out a little bit. Sarah has a slave from Egypt named Hagar. And as it was in those days, you could send your slave in to be the surrogate mother of a child. And so Sarah sends Hagar, and Hagar conceives with Abraham by the means of Abraham. And Sarah becomes so jealous that she sends the woman out into the desert to die. And then Hagar, the Egyptian, has a theophany, a God appearance. He tells her to go back and she will be received back home. But then, as the child is born, named Ishmael, Sarah is so jealous she sends the young child and the woman back into the desert From that comes the eternal conflict that we still deal with today. The fruits of that jealousy and Abraham not standing up to his wife and protecting his own flesh and blood still causes a strife in the Middle East. The lack of trust in God to fulfill God's covenant and promise will cause strife. But let's flash back. Even before the children, Abraham is not one of great faith. Sarah is known to be a beautiful woman in her young age. And one day there's this famine in the country of Canaan. And they have to flee to Egypt in order to eat. And as they enter in, Abraham looks at his wife with those eyes of a dove, brown, her beautiful skin. And he says to her, when they see you, Pharaoh will want you, and the soldiers will kill me. So tell Pharaoh that you are my sister, in essence, he pawns off his own wife in order to help God out in keeping God's promises. No Abraham, no descendants. Not only does he do it this time, but he does it another time with another king, a smaller potentate. And in that story, Abimelech says, has more righteousness and more faith than the central figure of our faith, Abraham. He sends her back and said, why didn't you lie to me? Then the day comes today that three messengers come to Abraham. And outside of the tent, Abraham greets them. Sarah is behind the flap of the tent. Now, Abraham is 100 years years old. 
Sarah is not far behind. And the strangers tell Abraham, you are going to have a son. Need I be graphic? I wouldn't but on that. And Sarah laughed. And that's how Isaac got his name. It means laugh. And she conceives. And she bears the son. But that's not the end of Abraham's story. Isaac is born. Ishmael may have died in the desert, but we know that he didn't. They are doting over this promised child in the age, in their aged youth. They love him fully. On him rests the future of the descendants and the covenant of God. And then Phil reads 22.1. After all these things, God tested Abraham. Thing I've mentioned is before the 22nd chapter. How will he respond? He says, I want you to take your son Isaac and make for me a burnt offering. Go to Mount Moriah. Abraham has to be about 110 years old. And they start out. And they come to the mountain, and the servants that are with them, he's, Abraham says, stay behind. And he brings the boy and gives the boy the wood for this burnt offering. And as they climb, it is Isaac who asks, where is the lamb for our offering? Surely we find as modern people this command of God to be repugnant. How can a loving God demand this sort of thing? To sacrifice the very thing we love so dearly and so greatly. It seems to us cruelty. Do we not want a more comfortable God? One with no commands or demands upon us. Yes, it is true, this text does not go down easily. We would rather have a God who would run errands for us, a tame God, a God that's in a cage that we can let out for a period of time, and when you say kennel, we'll go back in. Perhaps one of the problems we have is we cannot grasp fully the love of God until we grasp the pure power of God, the wisdom of God, the might of God. It's so human of us to worship always the gifts of God instead of the As a matter of fact, we recoil when we see love and sacrifice in the same sentence. They seem to be antonym of each other. And this text leads us down some hazardous road. And yet, at the same time, it is the most important text about Abraham's life and Abraham's faith. It is the point where Abraham must stop talking about faith and act in faith. 
must stop, stop talking about trusting in God and begin to act in trust of God. Where is the lamb? Little Isaac asked. What shall we sacrifice? The Lord. I know it is a difficult statement. We would prefer to help God out and to make sure, yes, the Lord will provide, but we need to get all our ducks in a row. The Lord will provide. But does that include losing the ones we love? Does that include losing that which is most precious to us? And sometimes, isn't it the willingness to sacrifice, the willingness to let go, demanded of us of God so that we with clarity know that the only place that we can depend is in the arms of God. Where shall we find? said that Solomon's temple was built on Mount Moriah. Now, some scholars think that 1,500 years later in this day of Mount Moriah, another young man picks up some wood and carries it for a sacrifice. But it is not to Mount Moriah he goes, it is to a hill called Calvary. And as I wrestled with this sermon, I've got this mental image that Jesus is nailed to the cross. And from the, his view on Golgotha, he could see the temple of Mount Moriah. And he would remember the story in his agony. God will provide. Even the loss of our own life. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do into your hand. I commend my spirit. And eventually, all of us go to that place. We do lose that which is closest to us. Those we love and by whom we are loved, we will eventually say goodbye. Or we may even ourselves have to give up our own lives. We know that that is our eventual destiny. So this story about Abraham is really our story, isn't it? It's about our own losing. And yet it is about our faith that no matter what happens in life, the Lord will. Perhaps it is not in the way we planned. Perhaps it is the ram and the butcher. My mother's family grew up in southern Arkansas. Actually, she was born right near a place called Roston. farming community. My father and my grandfather being a farmer, her father. It wasn't much of a town, a village. In 
now, many years later, it is gone. They say Roston, Arkansas, and I can't find it. Many fields are overgrown and weeds, but there is but one place. A small rise, a hill, and on that hill, a clapboard, white clapboard church. called Mount Moriah Baptist Church. And behind the church is a cemetery. I have been to Mount Moriah many times. And as my parents grow older, I know the time is coming when I will go Mount Moriah again. And it is there I will be asked the question in the face of death. Can I let them go? For those I have loved so dearly, can I let them go? How Will I go on? Can I trust? And all of us have been to Mount Moriah. And if you have not, you will. One day. And the one question you must answer for yourself. What can I do? my loss. Is the powerful God strong enough to provide? How can we go on? When those we love we lose. You see it's in faith. Please stand.